welcome Coventry University students today. Um, as Leanne said, we're going to talk about uh, various areas of investments uh, and uh, Leanne's agreed with me a few areas to cover, which she just mentioned just now. Um, I suppose the, the starting point has to be asset allocation um, or diversification of risk. We tend to explain it to clients in really simple terms because in our experience, uh, although our clients have been successful at accumulating some wealth, they, they, that doesn't mean they necessarily really understand everything because the investment world is full of jargon like any other profession. And we think it's important to express ourselves in language they understand. So rather than talk about asset allocation, we're more likely to explain to clients about not having all your eggs in one basket, which I think most people would understand. Yeah. So the traditional um, four um, assets, key assets that clients would traditionally be advised to invest in using traditional asset allocation would be um, shares or otherwise known as equities, bonds representing government bonds and corporate bonds, commercial property and to a much lesser extent cash. So they're the four key assets traditionally that will be held, um, especially using say uh, Professor Harry Markovitz's um, studies. So most, most independent financial advisors would tend to focus on those four asset classes. And there are various ways in which we offer an investment proposition to a client. Um, some advisors still have their own, what's known as SIPs or centralized investment proposition, where the advisors themselves choose the funds, they choose their own portfolio, and they would construct it based on those four main asset classes. And it would vary how much they put into each of those four assets, depending on the client's attitude to investment risk, which we measure um, by firstly asking clients to complete what we call a psychometric assessment, uh, which is a series of questions that helps us to ascertain what appetite for investment risk they have. And we don't solely rely on the answers to that because a number of clients find it a bit of a struggle to, to complete it because I don't know if any of you in the audience have ever completed a psychometric assessment. Usually it's for job interviews, but sometimes the, the questions can be hard to answer because it's like a multiple choice format of five answers. There's no right or wrong. You can't fail this test or assessment. It's purely to ascertain your attitude to investment risk and clients, some clients find it confusing and you get five answers and they, and they don't feel they fit into any of them. But the, the idea is that you've got to make a quick decision to which one either you are or you're closest to. And these questions are scientifically designed after lots of studies and they produce uncannily accurate results. Uh, the same as they do for job interviews, but you can't solely rely on a psychometric assessment because it's just a guide. Uh, you dig deeper by discussing it with the client because, as I said earlier, they don't always understand the, the technical words. And when you do explain it and teach them, then you may have a slightly different result to what appeared on the psychometric assessment. So what we do, we, we measure clients' attitudes and investment risk on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the highest um, attitudes and investment risk, 1 being the lowest. And the main difference between those scales of one to 10 is that the higher up the scale that you go, the nearer to 10, the more money gets invested in what we would describe as riskier assets, such as shares, for example. So if you risk grade 10, you have mostly money invested in shares. If you risk grade one, you have mostly money invested probably in uh, bonds and cash, maybe a little bit in property and anywhere in between. And as is normal with human behavior, most of our clients come out in the middle because that's what we're like, aren't we? We tend to go for the middle ground. So most of our clients are attitudes for risk four to six. 
So that's the traditional way of managing clients' assets. And uh, as I say, most independent financial advisors will have a centralized investment proposition of their own, or they may decide to outsource that element to perhaps um, a discretionary fund manager, such as a stockbroker, or it could be another type of investment company. Um, they may decide instead to use what we call model portfolios, um, which are, are ready-made portfolios for clients based on uh, uh, different risk levels. And, and whilst we're talking about investments, I think it's important to explain to you what we mean by risk. And we, what we mean by risk is what you would study at Coventry University. We're talking about standard deviation or the degree of volatility of the investment. That's what we this what we consider risk. So high risk is an investment that fluctuates in value. It's volatile. It doesn't mean it's it, you, you've got the risk of losing money because of course we are investing clients' money into investment funds, not into individual shares. Uh, individual shares are the highest risk of all because there's no investor compensation available. Uh, and the price can fluctuate wildly. And in fact, you, as you know, you can lose all of your money investing in one share. If one company goes bust, and there's been a few have gone bust um, during the lockdown. Um, so we tend to recommend funds that clients invest in. Um, each fund is managed by a fund manager who will typically invest in perhaps 40 or 50 shares on your behalf. So it's like a mini portfolio. Um, and most IFAs would probably invest in 12 to 15 funds within either their own centralised investment proposition or a, an outsourced discretionary fund management service or model portfolios, etc. So that's how we would manage clients' risks. Um, there is a growing uh, school of thought that this a traditional asset allocation model isn't suitable for the current period of time we're, we're in, in history, which is uh, the late stage of a long-term economic cycle, which Ray, Ray Dalio describes as a, a, a long-term debt cycle. And at this stage, because governments uh, in the world are, are highly indebted, particularly in the United States, the world's leading economy, um, and interest rates are rock bottom, inflation is, is very low. It's a time when certain asset classes is questionable how well they're going to or badly they're going to perform over the next 10 years or so um, and my particular concern at the moment is bonds now what i find is most in independent financial advisors are very wedded to this concept of asset allocation to those four main asset classes and it's been like that for quite a few decades now um, since Harry, Professor Harry Markovitz came up with his um, study, which won him a Nobel Peace Prize, his study into um, diversification of risk using asset allocation. Now, it has worked very well, um, investing in bonds for the last 40 years, because we've been in, in an unprecedented period of interest rates falling. I'm old enough to remember when interest rates in the UK hit a peak of 17%, base rates hit 17%. Can you guys imagine that when base rate today is 0.1%? It's, it's, just, it's just off the Richter scale. And interest rates ever since then, since the late 70s, have just kept coming down and down and down. And I recently wrote a blog on the 200-year history of interest rates in the UK. And interest rates literally have fallen for 40 years. Now, the value of bonds, corporate bonds and government bonds, is very... Um, much linked to interest rates. As interest rates fall, the value of bonds rises. Well, bonds have been a great place to invest for 40 years because interest rates keep falling, so the value of bonds keeps rising. Um, the trouble is it does lull you into a false sense of security. I know uh, a, an independent financial advisor, we call them IFAs, who's absolutely convinced that bonds are the place to have a significant amount of your money invested because in his lifetime of work which goes back about 30 years he's he's only ever seen bonds produce positive returns but he unfortunately he seems to have forgotten his studies because in your studies if you haven't already done it you will you will find out sooner or later that an investment in bonds 
is an investment in, in an asset which has a seesaw effect. Imagine sitting on a seesaw and it, the seesaw goes up and down. Um, well, as interest rates fall, the value of bonds rises. Well, what's going to happen when interest rates start rising? And I would suggest when interest rates are near zero or zero or even in negative territory in, in three countries in the world as we speak, what direction will interest rates go in next? Now, I don't need to ask a group of students what they think will happen when interest rates get to zero from a peak of 17% over 40 years. What will happen to interest rates next? Well, you might be clever and say some interest rates could fall further and they could go negative. Well, they could. But even if they go negative, they're not likely to go very negative. The, the worst negative rate in the world at the moment is minus 0.75%. Um, negative interest rates are, are still survive at the moment in, I think it's Sweden, Japan um, and Denmark. Um, but interest rates will rise. Uh, at this stage of the economic cycle, inflation is likely to return and rise as well as interest rates. And therefore, the future for bonds looks pretty bleak, in my opinion, for the next 10 years. Now, many IFAs would shoot me down in flames. They're so um, wedded to the theory of, of bonds and they've forgotten that interest rates can rise as well as fall. But I'm a student of history. And what I've discovered is that history repeats itself time and time and time again. And then it might repeat itself over a very long cycles i mentioned that long-term economic cycle 50 to 75 years the trouble is most people never lived long enough to go through this economic cycle so they're not they're, they're a bit complacent so i think the future is very bleak for bonds for the next 10 years at least so i'd be very wary about investing in bonds and it's not my favorite asset class whatsoever so personally i'm not keen on bonds um i run a separate fund management company which invests in seven investment themes of the future. It's a global equities fund. We don't invest any of our money in bonds and we don't intend to. We're about to introduce a discretionary fund management service, which means that the discretionary fund manager makes all the investment decisions, not the client and not the independent financial advisor. If we invest any money at all in bonds, it will only be in um, global bonds that produce a reasonable yield but I'm, I'm even reluctant to invest in any bonds at all at the moment um, so the the other one of the other asset classes worth considering is commercial property but even commercial property looks uh, at risk because when you think about it when you look at um, offices for example what's happened to offices during lockdown a lot of people have had to work from home and now they're getting so used to working from home that with video conferencing that individuals and companies are deciding to work more and more for home, from home and they're making it part of their strategy. So large companies are, are, are closing offices and deciding not to work from home. My own son works for an IT consultancy in the city of London. I'm not sure how many people they employ, but it's probably 30 or 40. They've been working from home the last six months. They've been they've found they're quite productive working from home, probably more productive than before. They've closed their offices permanently. That's just one little example. But I found I've heard of very large companies doing the same. Very large banks, etc., deciding to have many of their staff, hundreds of them, if not thousands, work from home permanently. So therefore, you can't help wondering that you know the the um the future for commercial property looks decidedly um, dangerous at the moment. Not just offices, but you've always only got to look at a retail premises, for example. What's happening to the high street? There's already a trend to buying on the internet, and Amazon's a great success story. But more and more of us are buying um, goods online, so, and less and less of us are going to shops. And of course, we're forced not to go to shops because of these repeated lockdowns. But I think what's happening in lockdown is that trends that were already happening, like video conferencing, uh, shopping online, etc., have just been sped up during the during the lockdown. So it's just a trend has, has been fast forwarded, if you like. So you can't help wondering that the future of retail premises is is dicey as well. So when you think that the three main areas of commercial property investment is um, industrial. So warehouses, factories, etc., retail, 
um, and offices, it's all quite mixed. The, the area that seems to have the best prospects seems to be warehousing. Um, because, of course, the likes of Amazon are just going to continue to grow. You're going to have to have somewhere to store the goods that you buy and then sell. So that area seems um, set for growth. And, of course, data centers. You know, this we, we're all working in the cloud, the so-called cloud. And, of course, there's no such thing as a cloud apart from the cloud I can see outside my window. That data is all stored somewhere. And it's usually stored in these, these highly secured data centers. So the future does look bright for certain um, sectors in commercial property. And it could be bright for certain retailers, but I think they've got to be pretty niche. I did hear a story once of a, a fairly small bike shop that was thriving in an internet age. And I wondered how they did it. And what they did was they made sure that the bikes they had were not branded bikes. So you couldn't buy them on the internet. And what they had is a service where you had to come into the shop to be measured up for your bike. I didn't realize that's how you, how you order a bike. It's got to be measured to you personally, like tailored, like a tailored suit. And I thought that's a great example of certain businesses will continue to thrive on the high street. For example, nail bars, um, hairdressers, you know, the top restaurants, do you really think about it? You can't buy any of those things on the internet. You never will be able to, will you? So I wouldn't say commercial property is dead, but I think you've got to, be, if you're going to invest in commercial property, I think you've got to be very selective and very intelligent and invest in the growth areas of commercial property. Um, otherwise, you know, your investment will be a pretty poor one. Um, so that moves us on to uh, the main asset class which determines your investment returns long term, and that's equities, that's shares. But even shares uh, look decidedly um, mixed at the moment because, of course, the coronavirus uh, pandemic and lockdowns is having a big negative effect on worldwide economies, causing governments to borrow huge amounts of money, which have to be paid back one day. It has to have a long-term negative effect on world economies, although you wouldn't believe it if you looked at stock market values, particularly the US. So uh, Ray Dalio, who I'll, who I'll keep mentioning, is, is a guru of mine because he's an incredible uh, character. He's fairly modest. He's, he's quiet. You don't hear much about him in the UK, but over in the United States, he's the 50th richest man at, from an independent survey is also the 50th most influential person in the world according to independent surveys. He's written some brilliant books. He's a real student of history. He runs the world's largest hedge fund that manages $160 billion of assets, which is extraordinary. And they won't take on any more business because they've got too big. Can you believe it? Um, so I do follow a lot of things he says. And he, Ray Dalio claims the next next 10 years is uh, a dead period for equities, for shares, which is all pretty gloomy. You're probably all sitting there at the moment thinking, crikey, this guy's been in this, me, I've been in this business 30 years. It all sounds like doom and gloom. Well, believe it or not, I'm actually an, I'm actually an optimist, um, but I'm also a realist. And we've got to, we've got to accept that we're going through very tricky times economically, but there will be winners coming out of this. There already are winners. And the big winners in the short term have been these giant tech companies we all are familiar with, the so-called FANGs. Uh, and and, and the, the FANGs, Facebook, Amazon, um, Apple, Netflix, Google, or Alphabet really, aren't they? You could, add, you could probably add Microsoft to that mix. They've done extremely well, uh, particularly um, Amazon during the pandemic lockdown. Uh, will those giant tech companies continue to do very well into the future? Um, most people think they will, but another guru I follow, Jim Mellon, is quite pessimistic. He, he says that giant tech stocks are, are going to be in for a very difficult time ahead because there's going to be increasing government regulation um, of these, these companies because they're monopolies. Uh, and monopolies have been broken up in the past. Again, if you go back in history, Standard Oil in, in the United States was broken up. I think it was back in the 30s. That became too much of a, a monopoly. 
uh, it's quite likely these companies will be broken up at some stage in the future, although not everyone would agree with me. Um, increased regulation. They're, they're famous for tax dodging. We all know that. Government's going to come crack down hard on them for tax. Um, they get their, their main uh, asset, their, their main um, asset they use in their business, data, for free, because all of us give our data up for free. I can see someone at the front of the room there constantly on their phone. So clearly they're using one of these uh, giant tech com companies. Um, and of course, they, 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 the people think that their, pro their huge profit is going to keep growing forever. But the, the thing I've learned over the many years I've been advising is that once you think something's certain and everyone agrees with it, it will all go the, the opposite direction. It's just, it just seems to be what always seems to happen in life, in my experience. So whilst they look like they're going to go on forever and just keep growing, I'm not convinced. Also, these companies are increasingly being fined by regulators such as the FCA, which, which seems to have a pop at Google every year because Google's sitting on $120 billion. If they hit them with a fine of like $1 billion or $2 billion, it's a very soft target, and they know they'll probably get paid out. Um, the other thing as well, these companies don't employ a lot of people uh, as a percentage of their turnover. For example, I remember once reading that Google employed something in the region of I think it was 10 or 20 computers um, to, to every one person. Uh, so when you think about it, there's not many people working in the company. There's not many people to tax. So what will the government tax? Because when you think about it, these companies, if they've got lots of computers doing the work rather than individuals, what are they other than robots, effectively? So they'll probably end up taxing the robots in the future. They've got to find the, the tax revenue from somewhere to make the, the systems continue to grow. So I still think they're, they're, they're probably going to do quite well for some years to come. But I, th I think in a few years' time, I think you're going to find they're going to be increasingly hit. So don't purely rely on giant tech to be the, the saviour. Having said all that, technology does seem to be the area with the most growth potential. So our own investment fund is invested in seven themes of the future. And it, it, it is invested in all these growth areas. So Internet of Things, robotics, 3D printing, um, artificial intelligence, uh, et cetera. And you can't help feeling this, these have got to be the growth areas. Um, and, and so there, there is still potential in equities. But when Ray Dalio says, says it's going to be a lost decade for equities, I think he's talking about across the board as a general asset that equities will face tough times. That doesn't mean you can't find a lot of winners. And I think you will, if you're quite clever with carefully choosing the companies to invest in, you can't help thinking that technology and technology led companies are the ones that got by far the greatest um, potential in the future, but just be very wary of um, giant tech. Uh, now, I don't know if I describe Tesla as a giant tech company, but it's a good, it's a good case in point. Um, Tesla has captured a lot of people's imagination, including my own. I, I own a Tesla myself, and I do think the car is an incredible car. It's not like any other car I've ever driven. Um, but that's not the same as saying that Tesla's a well-run company. Financially, Tesla's a complete disaster, the way it's run. It's run by a flawed genius, as you all know, Elon Musk. And the company's been running for about... 15 years or so, it's never made a dollar profit ever from selling cars. And it doesn't look like it ever will. Um, now, it's accepting wisdom that the, the valuation of a company, as measured by something known as the, the PE ratio, is around about 15 at the moment. And if you invest in a company that's got a PE ratio of, say, more than 30, you'd, you'd consider that expensive. Now, some of those giant tech companies have PE ratios of about 30 or 25, not too bad, a bit expensive, but understandable when they keep increasing their profits every year. You could argue it's justified if profits continue to rise. But Tesla's got a PE ratio of 1,100 compared to the average of the market of 15. I can tell you that is completely crazy valuation. And Tesla is due for a huge fall. Now, there are another, a number of other companies that are in this speculative bubble at the moment uh, 
a company called Kodak. You're probably all too young in the room to remember Kodak, but I remember Kodak being the leading company for film and for cameras, for photography. Kodak dominated the, the world market. When you had traditional cameras that produced um, hard copy photographs, but of course, the digital camera came along and mobile and, and smartphones. And Kodak, believe it or not, they actually invented the first digital camera, but they didn't take it seriously. They didn't think it would take off, that it would replace traditional cameras and, and hard copy photos. So they didn't really um, build the idea. Well, Kodak then went bankrupt a few years ago. Now, in America, you can have it be bankrupt, chapter 11 bankruptcy, but still continue to trade. I find it a bit strange myself, but so Kodak is still limping along. It's still managing to trade. But they've been lent um, a huge amount of money by the US government. Um, I think it's $800 million they were lent. And the share price went up 1,600% in one day. Well, this to me is a sign of a, a stock market that's really a big bubble. You know, it, how a company, and, and Kodak is, the purpose of Kodak now the reason they got this grant from the government or this loan from the government was develop, to develop the, the constituent elements that go into um, a vaccine for coronavirus. Well, I thought Kodak was a film company. What do they know about um, vaccines? What do they know about um, uh, science? You know, and, and so the mere fact that they were lent $800 million meant the share price rose 1,600%. Well, I just think that's crazy. All they've done is taken on the debt. And because there's many other companies creating a, vi a, a, vi a vaccine at the moment, who's to say that Kodak's got any better chance than anybody else? So I, I think there are a couple of examples of completely crazy valuations of companies in the US. And I think there's too many companies like that that are t crazily overvalued. Um, and I think that the technology sector in America is quite dangerous at, at the moment, although we're a bit uh, compromised because our fund does invest in technology and technology led companies. So we're carefully making sure we reduce our holdings in US stocks and any assets that are denominated in dollars, such as gold, for example, which we hold at the moment, uh, which brings me on nicely to other asset classes that are worth considering having an investment portfolio. Not, now again, not every IFA would agree with me, but I think you can't ignore these. Ray Dalio, who I mentioned earlier, ran, has run a very successful hedge fund. And one of their strategies is um, something they call um, all, all weather or all seasons portfolio. And this one's quite interesting. It, bear in mind, it's, he's, he's run it during a period when interest rates have been falling. So a lot of it's been invested in bonds, 55% um, in bonds, uh, government bonds. Um, and of the 55%, from memory, I think it's 40% in long-term and 15% short-term bonds. That's 55%. He's only been invested about, from memory, 25% in shares, which is unusual. No money in commercial property. Uh, he invests um, some money in commodities, about 7.5% in commodities, about 7.5% in gold, and 15% elsewhere, I, I can't recall. But what I found was quite interesting about Ray Dalio's portfolio is over a long period of years, maybe 20, 30 years, this portfolio has made an average return of 7 8% a year consistently, even in years when the stock market's fallen. When the stock market had a huge fall back in 2008, I think his fund was down what, 1 or 2%, and, and the US market was down over 30%. So it's, it's, a, it's a fund that's produced consistent returns year in, year out. And the reason he calls it all weather is because he, he calculated that there's only four things that can affect um, asset prices. And, that, and those four things were um, inflation, which can rise or fall. And the other factor, I think, was economic growth that could rise or fall. Anyway, basically, because there was 
four things there. Each aspect could rise or fall. That meant there was four seasons. And he calculated that if he could invest in all these different asset classes, such as commodities, gold, bonds, equities, everything had a season when it would rise in value. And I thought that was quite, quite smart. And this is based on a huge amount of research. And it, it has worked incredibly well for all those years. But here's the rub. It doesn't work anymore. And the reason it doesn't work anymore, as I mentioned to you earlier, because these bonds, these bonds can't rise anymore because interest rates can't fall anymore. So this year, they're having a really bad year, the first bad year for, in a very long time, which just goes to show, like I said earlier, once you're onto a sure thing and everyone agrees, that's the time you're going to get your fingers burned. So the thing with investing, it's incredibly complex. It's incredibly unpredictable. And even when you think you've got it right, and, and logically everything you're doing does make sense, uh, the markets can still go against you. There's an old saying, um, I think it was Keynes, the, the great economist, that the market can remain irrational longer than you can be solvent. And I think they're very wise words. Um, so even when you, you've got everything right, uh, the, the, for some weird reason, um, stock markets can remain irrational, and sometimes for years, so for years they could, the, the prices can be misaligned. Like, for example, the Tesla case I gave you just now. Tesla's shares will have a huge fall. I just can't tell you when. So I could try to be clever, and in fact, I did try to short Tesla's shares, which is where you profit from the share price falling on a personal level. That's why I shorted Tesla shares, got my fingers burnt quite badly. Now, luckily, I didn't in invest a lot of money each time. But when, I, when Tesla's P ratio got to 1,200, I just thought, this, it's, it's incredible. It's just totally unsustainable. It's totally illogical. It's got to fall. But of course, my investment in it was premature. I think I'll be right, but it might not be for another two or three years. And in the meantime, I'm not prepared to take any more chances. So I think that's a very wise thing to come out. You might not come across that in your studies, but I do think that's very true. And I, I recently read a book on hedge funds, um, which are e extraordinary um, funds. They're not like traditional investment funds in that the managers are able to take quite a lot of risk and they can take bets on assets rising in value or falling in value. So they can go long if it goes up or go short if it goes down. And they can use all kinds of derivatives. Um, they can take higher risk than a, tr than a traditional fund manager or a bank. Uh, and their, their fees are huge. They'll charge 1% to 2% a year and 20% of the profits they generate for you. But in spite of all that, in spite of taking more risk, in spite of higher charges, the return net of charges to investors is still higher than traditional fund managers. And there are several reasons for that. And one reason is that these hedge fund managers have their own money invested in the fund. It's often a requirement to work for the hedge fund that you have to invest your own money in the fund, which I find quite interesting because, of course, when you've got your own money invested, you're going to be much more careful. So even though, in theory, they take higher risk, in practice, hedge fund managers are managing that risk far better than traditional institutions like um, investment banks. Um, and they're a far lower risk to the, the worldwide economy than, than these banks, because when hedge funds fail, they don't have a, a terrible uh, harmful effects on the economy. Um, now, the thing with hedge funds is that they primarily service institutions. They're not there for individuals, unless you're a very wealthy individual who wants to invest in, in hedge funds. They're not as highly regulated as traditional fund managers, um, but you can learn a lot from them. The trouble is they're quite secretive. So, so to find out about Ray Dalio's all weather portfolio was quite challenging um, because they don't normally disclose it, but um, Anthony Robbins wrote a book um, a, a couple of years ago on personal finance, and he managed to get an interview with Ray Dalio, and Ray Dalio disclosed the all-weather portfolio uh, 
uh, breakdown, which he'd never done before. Um, and that's how we found out about it. We don't know what his current um, strategy is. We think it's not dissimilar to what it's been in the past. But I think it's for the reasons I've given, I think he needs to change his, his um, asset allocation, um, especially the bond allocation, which needs to be reduced. Um, so we've talked about um, asset allocation. We've talked about the main assets you would use. Um, I've been very influenced by Ray Dalio. Uh, I'm gloomy about uh, bonds. I think unless you're very selective with shares, you could experience trouble with shares as well to come. And you've got to be very careful with commercial property to choose the correct commercial property to invest in. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about our own uh, fund and our own um, discretionary fund management service, which we're about to launch, in that we've been quite influenced by Ray Dalio. And unlike pretty much all um, UK fund managers and discretionary fund managers, we're going to have a different approach. We, we are very keen to include um, precious metals and commodities in our asset allocation because at this stage of the long-term economic cycle, as I mentioned earlier, um, inflation is going to return. It always happens towards the end of the reign of an empire and the United States Dadio does describe as an empire and this 50 to 75 year cycle it's had is going to come to an end in the next few years and inflation will return and, and in fact the US have just announced recently they're going to let inflation run. They can't create inflation as such but they're not going to try to control it. So they're admitting really that, in, in, that inflation has to rise and traditionally the way you pay off a lot of debt um, by individuals and countries is to have inflation because of course when you think about it if you have high inflation the value of your debt depreciates so the US have to introduce inflation so that means that if you're investing in assets such as commodities and precious metals they tend to perform well when you have high inflation and also when you have uncertain times and we've got those we've got both of those things happening at once at the moment so we feel very keen to invest more in those asset classes so it could be gold it could be silver it could be even palladium uh, and other precious metals but uh, and commodities if you look at the value of commodities they're really at a very low point at the moment so they look set to grow as well. So it makes sense to invest in those kind of assets when inflation's rising um, and we're in uncertain times, as I mentioned. So they'll certainly be included in our discretionary fund uh, portfolio, um, discretionary fund management portfolio. Um, in terms of what factors affect investment trends, well, we, we do realise that when inflation and interest rates are very low, it's very hard to get an a very high investment return. It just, it's always been that way if you look back in history. So with inflation interest rates at virtually zero, if you can muster an investment return of say 5% a year by having a very um, diversified investment approach by not having all your eggs in one basket, then you're probably doing quite well. Now 5% might not sound like very much, but bearing in mind this is, a, a, an investor who's only a medium risk investor who's not taking a lot of risk fairly conservative investing in some real assets like property and shares uh, so an average return of five percent is, is likely if you were to uh, invest in a time when there is more inflation and, and higher interest rates and by which i don't mean massive inflation or interest rates but maybe interest rates sitting at four percent and inflation may be sitting at 2%, which when you look at the long-term history of interest rates, an interest rate of around about 4% in the UK has been a long-term average for many, many decades, the last 200 years. So that would probably be a bit more of a sensible interest rate. So when you start getting interest rates at 4%, inflation at maybe 2 or 3%, that's when you can expect to get investment returns of maybe 10% a year. 
It's pretty healthy. Now our own investment strategy, centralized investment strategy, which we call the wealth investment strategy, does have a very good long-term track record of 9.4% a year um, over the last 24 years for a medium risk investor. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the, the higher up the risk scale you go, the higher the return you're likely to get, but it'd be a much more rocky ride because it's much more volatile. So if you were to ask me what I would invest in, I would, if I was a client, I'd probably be risk grade 10, which would be the highest attitude to risk you could have. Not because I'm prepared to lose all my money, but because I know that if I'm going to invest for 10 years or more, risk grade 10 is going to give me the best return but it will rise and fall a lot more. So you need to bear that in mind. Um, one of the other areas that I agreed with uh, Leanne to cover is portfolios. Uh, I think I've covered that to an extent, talking about the centralized investment proposition provided by independent financial advisors, discretionary fund management, multi, uh, multi asset funds, uh, model portfolios, these are all different approaches that all work to greater or lesser extent. Um, if you were to invest personally and just simply want to get the best returns and, and you are prepared to take more risk, particularly at your young ages, I would personally probably invest 100% into, into shares. And I would do it long term. I'd probably be investing monthly. So you get the benefit of some, something known as pound cost averaging. Um, which means you're buying the investment at an average price rather than piling all your money in at once when the prices might be high and you could lose a lot of money or, 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 the, or the opposite investing when prices are very low. You take out the element of guesswork in terms of are you buying at the right time or not. So because you've got a long time horizon, if you're in your early 20s, for example, typically, then you can afford to take greater investment risk because you've got a longer period for, for things to correct if they go wrong, for example. So that's what I would do. I would, if I were you, I'd invest in, in, in high risk fund, maybe, maybe even our own CCM intelligent wealth fund, because it's investing in all those um, growth areas of the present and the future in technology or technology led companies. Uh, and it's a global equities fund. So, so I think that would be a good thing for young people to do. Um, as for older people, they tend to be a lot more conservative. You know, they've built up all their wealth. They've got to retirement age. They don't want to take big risks with their money. They don't want to lose it. So we would still have more of an asset allocation approach, as I mentioned to you earlier, spreading the investment across all the asset classes. But now with our discretionary fund management service, we're going to add some additional classes, namely commodities and, and precious metals. Um, I think I've, I've covered as much as I can think of for the moment, Leanne. I don't know if there's any questions you, anyone would like to ask. Silence. <laughs> Leanne, are you still there? I'm here, yes. I'm trying to get my audio back. One second. Oh, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Can yes, you hear me? Yes, yeah, I can fine. Hear yeah, thank you, Tony, uh, for a very uh, a fascinating, fascinating insights into the investment world at the moment. And um, before I ask any question, perhaps I can open the floor to students. Would anyone like to ask Tony a question about investments? Yes, I have a question. Yes, yes good. And uh, thank you, sir, for the uh, nice presentation, firstly. And I just wanted to ask um, if there is any way, um, how can I deal with the stock, stock investments in a, in, a, in, a, in a good way? Um, well, you mean you want to get started in investing, you mean? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I, I, I haven't started yet uh, with stock investment, but I, I'm interested in. So okay, well, it depends on, probably depends on your budget. Uh, whether you want to invest a lump sum or invest monthly, but there are many organizations, including our own, where you can set up a, say a monthly payment or, or an annual or a lump sum payment into an investment. 
you're probably looking at, depends how much you're looking to invest really and for how long, I suppose, is the key question. But um, there are many ways you can invest your, your money quite easily these days on the internet. But you'd probably be looking, if it's for yourself, you talk about for yourself personally, Hyun. Is it Hyun or Hyun? Hyun, yeah. Hyun. What is it for you personally? Like, um, I've heard that the stock investment, it's um, like the shares, they are yeah. really a good way to uh, expand my budget and money as well. Well, I'd say if I were you, I'd probably invest in a fund because, as I mentioned yeah. earlier, a fund manager will typically invest in maybe 40 or 50 shares on your behalf. And we will, I will be introducing you to, or Liam will be introducing you to Awet um, Gamar, Gamani in a moment, who used to be a student at Coventry University, and he's now our investment researcher for the fund. And I know personally that Awet puts in many, many hours of research. So you're getting the benefits of a research, research team that will invest many hours in finding the best stocks that are out there for you saves you having to do it yourself so it's probably the lowest risk way of doing it because you also have the benefit if it's a a fund such as something known as an oic or, or a unit trust these are highly regulated funds and you have something known as an investor compensation scheme worth up to eighty five thousand pounds so if in the unlikely event that one of these funds failed you get all your money back so i think that's quite quite key um, and the diversification of risk that I've, I've spoken about at length today, you get the uh, diversification by using someone who's or, or a firm that's studying these stocks permanently, permanently reviewing them and, bu and buying and selling stocks, selling stocks that are underperforming, buying stocks that are, that are overperforming and managing the portfolio, effectively managing a portfolio for you. And because you, you can do it monthly as well, it's quite a low cost way of of buying and, and reducing your risk, I would say. So that's what I would do. I would invest, if you're getting started, I'd invest in a fund and probably do it monthly. I'll do it monthly. Okay. Johnny, can I ask you about the the funds that you invest in? You mentioned that there's several uh, themes or several seven factors that you focus yeah. on. You mentioned precious metals and commodities. <laughs> What are the other six? You say robotics, 3D printing, AI. Yeah, they're not strict. They're not strictly the, um, the main asset of the fund. We're temporarily invested in gold, more as a hedge in the short term, um, not because we believe that's the long term uh, asset class investing for the fund, because of course gold isn't uh, one of the seven uh, growth themes of the future. It's just a temporary measure because stock, current stock market volatility that's the only reason we've invested in that but it, if you want to know about the seven um themes if you just bear with me a moment i'll read them out to you um right the seven themes and you can find this on our website it's minerva money management if you just type into google minerva money management you'll find our website so the seven areas is connectivity so for example, internet, um, et cetera, longevity, which includes biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, longevity itself as a subject, uh, payment processing, which is really all things to do with modern banking, um, transportation, which we could include electric cars, uh, automate, automated, automators, automated, Autonomous. autonomous vehicles, um, automation, all things that like robotics and all things all, autonomous, renewable energy, we're very keen on, and publishing. By publishing, we mean online publishing, you know, like Google and the like. So they're the seven main, main themes, and within them includes sub themes such as artificial intelligence. Augmented reality, 3D printing, you know, robotics, um, Internet of Things, and on all those areas, we think these are, are definitely the, the, the biggest growth areas in the world. As I say to you earlier, the, the, the problem we've got is that we're pessimistic about the dollar and about the US, and the problem is that 
the greatest technology companies in the world currently are in the US, although there are some fantastic British companies and we invest in quite a few of those. And of course, the Chinese, you can't underestimate. They've got, we talk about Silicon Valley in the US, but they've got a city, Shenzhen, the city of the future in China. It's, it's extraordinary, you know, and, and I don't know why it doesn't get more publicity. It, it's, it's got extraordinary innovation and technology there. And China is fast catching up with and probably going to overtake America, and probably already is in some in many ways. So one of the things we're going to do in the future is invest more in the growth areas of the world. And we consider them to be China, number one, um, emerging markets, Japan, um, UK. UK vastly undervalued because of the uncertainty over Brexit, vastly undervalued. It's the sixth biggest economy in the world and home to many brilliant companies, many of which we're invested in. So we're very bullish about that. So we think you should invest in undervalued companies in undervalued markets in the world and, and move away from areas that have had a great, great run, but have got a lot of um, negative prospects, particularly the US and particularly the dollar. If you visit our site, you'll find it very fascinating, Minerva Money Management. Yeah, that's very interesting because um, I was reading about the BlackRock, uh, the BlackRock publishes an article called Mega Trends, and they talk about five different trends that's affecting society at the moment. The first one is rapid urbanization. So because of urban, uh, rapid urbanization in yes. many uh, uh, areas around the world, you need to have a better infrastructure, um, yeah. e-scooters, electric vehicles, um, yeah online takeaway. So in China, for example, people can order their, their, their food online using, uh, you know, um, and it, it, it WeChat or whatever. So that's one trend which they talk about. The second trend is technology. So yeah. you've got the e-commerce, electric vehicles, robotics, blockchain, cloud computing, streaming, solar panels, which you talk about as well. Yeah. And the third one is demographics and social change. So uh, the aging population lead to kind of, you know, the need for better health care. Um, yeah. And then there's also shifts in consumer spending as well. So yeah. now we've got a lot of older people, don't we? And so maybe the, the way they spend the money is different from the, the traditional uh, patterns. Yes. And the fifth, one, the fourth one is the emerging uh, global wealth. They talk about uh, that India is likely to overtake China in the, in the future. Um, so I don't know what would happen if India will overtake China, whether we should, uh, you know, maybe uh, focus more on India rather than China. And the fifth one is climate change and resource scarcity. So, so here you need to have uh, renewable energy, solar, and also energy efficiency, which is going to be a big thing as well, isn't it? So some of those things I think you cover as well. well so we cover, was, in the end, we cover all of them. Um, yeah. It's funny you should say that. I'm not so... Um, sure about India. In what India is going to overtake China in, in terms of its population, but it's not an economic miracle like China. And, it, and they, they don't expand. China's been very smart uh, in many, many ways. And one of the things they've created is a second Silk Road, haven't they, in the seas, yeah. in emerging uh, uh, countries, in their infrastructure. And they've, they've built lots of projects, including a, a, a big railway line, haven't they, on the Silk Road, the traditional Silk Road. So. Oh, India's not smart like that. Most Indians, their main uh, aim at the start of the day is, is to get a meal inside their stomach. So there's a huge amount of poverty still in India. Whereas I've witnessed, personally witnessed in China, there, there's, there's huge, huge wealth. And, and if you can move uh, a Chinese uh, farmer into a city, and they've done a lot of this, they've, they've shifted hundreds of millions of people out of the farms into the cities, your personal income will rise 20-fold. So what China's doing, they're converting their economy from an export-led economy into a domestic economy because, of course, many of the top countries in the world, like the US and UK, have a mainly domestic-led economy. So what Chinese government has done is very cleverly created a system whereby if you work in a city, you have a huge amount of surplus income. I've witnessed it. And people have got huge amounts of money to spend. And that so when you think about it, because China's got 1.4 billion people in, in the country, America's got 350 million. The aim of the Chinese government is to create the same per capita disposable income of the Chinese as the US. What that will mean 
is that the Chinese economy will grow to be four times the size of the US one. And I think it's, it's, it's certain to happen. And back to my, my hero, Ray Dalio, if you look at his, look, he's, he's gone back 5,000 years to, to study um, empires of the world. Um, and a lot of his study goes back to the Chinese dynasties that go back 5,000 years, same pattern, every 50 to 75 years, same thing happens. History just keeps repeating itself again and again and again and again. And the only government in the world where their leading politicians study history and apply history consistently because they know history will keep repeating itself is the Chinese. So they're an extraordinary race. If you, if Ray Dalio proves that going back thousands of years on eight economic measures, China has virtually always been the leading economy in the world, apart from the last 200 years. But they're now back to very close to being the leading economy in the world, and it will happen again. Mm. So definitely think we should, I, I definitely agree with all those um, mega trends, and we're definitely uh, investing in all of them. But we're very careful to make sure, you know, we'd, we'd be much keener to invest in Chinese uh, uh, the Chinese economy than the Indian one, I would suggest. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Tara, um, would you, does your group have any questions? Uh, hi, I have a question. Okay, yeah, Navid. Um, hi, Tony, i um, just going to introduce uh, myself. My name, my name's Navid. Um, I've sent you a little LinkedIn message as well when you get a chance to pop over and look at that. Um, I, ju I just want your opinion, and uh, you were mentioning about precious metals. Um, I just want your opinion on what you what you forecast for silver regarding this volatility, what's going on between gold, and I just want your take on what you think are the predictions of silver. It's um, yeah, go on. Um, it was trading, as far as I know, it was trading something like about £300 pounds for per kilo in early March. And yeah, silver's about, 20, about $23 at the moment. Um, a few months ago, silver got to the stage where its value compared to the value of gold had reached a record gap. Because gold's always been more popular than, than silver. Silver's always been the poorer cousin. Um, I, I can't tell you what's going to happen to the gold and silver price, but it's likely with inflation returning and all the, the continuing um, un upset and, and uncertainty in the world, it's likely that these precious metals will continue to rise. Jim Mellon, I mentioned earlier, He's got a tremendous track record of getting things right. He predicts the silver will go to thirty dollars. Gold at the moment is what is it? Our gold at the moment um, is it six hundred? Around that, but yeah. No, two thousand. No, not not with that yet, but yeah. Uh, I think you think this gold will go to. I can't remember what the current price is. Uh, gold. Let's check it out. Uh, check it out. Just give me a moment. Yeah, no. Gold price. Gold price, oh sorry, gold price is just under 1900. Yeah, Jim Mellon expects gold to go to two and a half, maybe three thousand uh, dollars an ounce. Don't say it's a prediction, and this is what Jim Mellon thinks. He thinks silver will go to at least thirty dollars, uh, probably more. Um, again, based on history, you know, when they've got all these uncertain times and inflation returns, you, and also it's because all this um, government stimulus has created a bubble in asset prices and and. What happens at this stage of the long-term economic cycle is asset prices get pushed up so high, they've got no further to go. And so you look for a safe haven. And, and I don't consider silver and gold personally. I don't think they're very good long-term investments. But at the moment, they're a good place to be, I would say. So as I say, don't, don't take that as a prediction. I can't tell you what's going to happen next. But Jim Mellon and thinks they'll both go. They'll both rise quite strongly. Okay, thank you. Do you all have any questions? No? No question? Okay. Uh, no question from my class, Lynn. Um, thank you. Tony, um, for those students who want to learn more about investments and um, start thinking about building their own wealth, um, what kind of books would you recommend? Can you give them a list of maybe five books that they could start uh, on their journey to learn more about investments? Well, of course, I'm a bit biased, so that you, you've got to start off with the Bible, my book, Wealth Management. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay fine we got a few books uh, we've got a few copies hi Owen we've got a few copies yeah, yeah. So some of the books I might recommend might not be necessarily academic books but I think I'd say Dalio's books are academic he's written a number coming with the full titles one's um principles which is an extraordinary book 
And I definitely think you should have that on your university reading list or study list, Leanne. Three fourths of, of success, yeah. Of course. What were the other yeah. books? The Dalio, Dalio's. The debt crisis. The debt. Yeah. The debt crisis. Yeah. The debt crisis. I don't know that. Debt cycles. Debt cycles. Debt cycles is another one. He's writing one as we speak. Yeah. On, uh, is it the changing empires? So they are they are academic studies. They really are, um, and, and they're brilliant books. And on a personal level, I found um, they're not necessarily academic books, but I think um, Think and Grow Rich is an all time classic written in the nineteen thirties. And it's not just about money; it's about richness of the entire wealth on every level. Yeah. Um, I liked Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, what else? Um, oh, I, lo I loved um, Richest Man in Babylon. Yeah. Um, any more you could add? The Magic of Thinking Big, maybe. Um, the Magic of Thinking Big. Uh, what about that one? Um, the Magic... Uh, the magic formula. Magic formula. Yeah, by, I think that's uh, for investment. Magic for formula investment. is another brilliant book. I mean, there's just there's no. I could talk all day about these brilliant books, but uh, there's many that will expand your mind, expand your horizons. Yeah, great. That's great. Thank you very much. So, shall we have Awad on then, and maybe yeah. he can share uh, his experience with the students? You got about fifteen minutes, I think. Right. Minutes. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Tony. Wonderful. It's really Thank good. You. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. That's right. good. Um, Shall I leave you to it? I'll leave, sure, sure, I'll leave yeah. you to it. Yeah, thank you, Tony, again for a good, uh, really great lecture. Yeah, you're welcome. I'll leave you to it. Sure, sure. Can you sit then? Oh, yeah. <laughs> So perhaps I can introduce Awit uh, quickly. Um, so Awit graduated about two years ago. Awit, is that correct? Right. A year, yeah, 2019, yeah. Yeah, 2019. So that's last summer then. So you started to work with Wealth and Tax uh, just after you uh, you finished your uni in May, isn't it? You, uh, you yeah, started... yeah, June. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so you studied finance and investments at Coventry right. and you've been working at Wealth and Tax now in your role as a research analyst. Right, right. Since you joined in last, yeah. So right. I, I'm really, really happy that you could join us. Perhaps you can share with us your insights into the world of investments and maybe can offer our students some uh, tips in, in terms of career path. Sure, yeah. I, this is first year students. Yeah, I went, this is the first year students, so be gentle on them. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. I mean, yeah, I, I think the investment world is a very, um, very, com not complicated, but it's quite exciting and always, um, I think you have to do a lot of study to understand everything because you wouldn't know everything because it's pretty much um, you are investing in the future. Actually, the things that you have to read pretty much, not just about finance you need to understand about technology. For example, I studied finance and investment, but what I do is pretty much technology. We invest in technology. So you have to understand the numbers about like um, the valuation of companies and you have to understand which technology is, um, uh, is gonna benefit in the future. For example, where we have invested in 5G and this trends that we see in the future. I think um, uh, uh, basically what I'm trying to say here is you have to understand uh, the numbers in finance and the valuation of companies, and you have to understand what's happening in the world. For example, I think Tony, he was talking about gold. For example, the main reason he's talking about gold now is because of central banks are printing a lot of money. When central banks are printing more money, actually um, gold and there's a, um, a correlation between gold and money. The more money the government prints, it will buy less gold right i think it's, it's it's always good to understand that the more money the government prints it will buy less gold so gold price will go up and money fiat currency will depreciate so i i think um you have to know um a, a lot about this um sort of things you have to understand and you have to read more i think not just um um, um more books as well to understand and, and companies basically and businesses and i, I personally think um First, when I started here, I was um, because you buy um, an investment and then the share price suddenly is down 10%. But if you do your maths correctly and you just stick to um, your, your investment thesis and you wait for years, I think it pays off. And I think in investment, one thing I've learned is patience and then understanding what you're doing and stay with what you know. And then the things that you don't know, you have to just basically um, focus on the things that you know. And, and then invest in the things that you know. 
Um, in terms of career advice, I, I think, um, for example, me, the way I got to, to this job is um, through the university. Um, I think it was Kelly. Um, she was sending us job application and then I ended up applying for, I had an, um, I think I had an interview with Barclays first and then and here and Wells and Tax. And I, I think they both offered me the position. I ended up coming to Wells and Tax because um, I think Barclays, they took so long to for the application process. And it, was, it seems it was taking too long. I ended up coming to Wells and Tax and I, I have been working with Wells and Tax for over a year and three months so far. And I think I, I'm enjoying it here so far. And yeah, um, I, I think it would be good if you can ask me a question, I think, to answer it yeah. and with me, yeah. Oh, wait, tell us your typical day. What do you do on a daily basis in terms of your role? Right, um, typical day would be nine o'clock. Um, I would, um, for an hour, I would look into the market and read um, a little bit of the research about the macro economy. If there's any trend in the market, what's happening? Pretty much just look at what's happening in the market. And after that, I started my research of companies. For example, I would look at company and I was looking um, last, I think in the, when the, for example, when the pandemic happened in, in March, I was looking for Alibaba. And the reason I was following the company, I do the calculation and I look at the price to earn, the valuation basically, price to book, price to earning, and the company future growth. And then Tony, he was talking about China, for example. So I, I've been looking at companies. So I look at companies firstly and I do the valuation for, for example, the discounted cash flow. And you look at the future growth of the companies. So I look at companies and valuation. And then I start researching, for example, about the companies that I'm following. Mm -hmm. okay. So I do research, for example, the research will include um, from evaluation of the company and the management always have to be, the management have to have um, a good a track record, right? And a long-term vision and, and, and look at the management and look at the, uh, the company competitors as well. So my day-to-day -day um, uh, uh, task will be um, analyzing companies, looking at the valuation and, 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 and researching more about the company, getting to know more about the company. And, 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 and finally, uh, when we're happy, when I finalize the research and I email it to Tony and, 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 and basically based on that, we make a decision. So, um, Awit, just yeah. be curious, where do you get your information from to help you um, kind of like analyze companies? What, what would be the reliable source of information? Um, the reliable, we have a, um, a software called Stockpedia. So we use that for uh, accounting, fine, uh, for accounting information. And I go to Reuters and I personally think the best source of information you could find is um, to read the company's annual report. Because on the annual report, they always, about the company, they write everything from what they're planning to do, from, um, I mean, pretty much what they can, what they're planning, how much they spend their money about the management uh, payment and everything. So I personally think the best source of information would be to read the annual report, mm -hmm. to read the, uh, the annual report and, and to read the, I think they do like proxy and all of the report, the company that they publish um, to read them. And I know they're quite long. Uh, I mean, sometimes they write 500 pages of annual report. If you find them longer, I think if you think they're longer, you can write that they do a presentation sometimes, which is, a shorter version of the annual report. I think you can read them. And, and I think the best source of information. At the moment. Yeah, great. So just take us through then. You talk about valuation of companies. Yeah. Uh, when, so what is it are you looking for to value them? So how do you value companies? Because okay. they're first year students, we just want to go back to the basic. So how do you value a company and how do you know which one are better than others? Right, the, the first thing you do is, I think most people are, uh, are familiar with the price to earning ratio. You look at the price to earning ratio. Basically, that means the price of the company share price divided by the earning. So you do the PE div uh, price divided by earning. So that will give you a figure. So I always look at the price to earning and, and, and then I look at the price to book because price to book would give me how much I'm paying exactly based on equity, for example. The, Price to book means is the price to equity of the, of the company. So I look at the measurement, uh, price to equity and price to sale as well, how much is the company is trading um, in regard to sales. 
And I look at to them and I look at the debt, the company. I mean, for example, if the company has a lot of debt, which is you have to avoid because um, even though interest rate is lower um, to, to pay your debt is, is quite cheaper, but you have to think about the company earning. Is it sustainable for the long run to cover the debt? And, 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 and I, I look at the company, for example, I mentioned earlier price to book. For example, the price to book uh, sometimes could be higher, but for example, um, you have to think about this valuation. There's two types of valuation. For example, the way you value company for um, a manufacturing company and a technology company is different. Mm. Because manufacturing company, they have hard uh, physical asset there. So you need to focus on price to book, price to sell, and this traditional um, valuation method. But if you analyze in Facebook, you don't have to rely on this um, um, and uh, valuation metrics. You have to look at the um, and how much um, users they have and how much they can grow because this intangible asset is not valued into the company statement. It's hard to value this sort of thing. So you have to think out of the box and mm -hmm. think about Facebook's user, how many users do they have and how much uh, Facebook do they contribute per user? So you have to change your approach your approach would change it depends on the company. Great. Right. Great. So which companies are in favor at the moment, are at the flavor at the moment? Which companies are you are you you think will do well in the next few months during the lock during COVID? Um, well I personally think there's a transit transaction, I mean transition here. If you look at the FUSI 100 is 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 down and then the reason is it's not recovered is because there's a um, there's a transition bit from like the traditional um, oil and, and all these um, natural gas companies to like a technology and solar energy. I mm -hmm. personally think um, even though it's, it's, it's very costly to get the solar energy, but this is the feature, the green energy movement is, is, is the feature to move to more sustainable um, energy. I think that has a long term um, it's going to benefit from that. And again, I think the payment um, system as well as payment companies are benefiting from uh, COVID. I think people are working from home and pretty much they're doing, um, I mean, they're ordering things online. And companies like Amazon will, will definitely benefit from, uh, from, I think, from what's happening now. And I think there's a transition. Technology, for example, in general will benefit. And then that's why we see technology companies are recovered from uh, the mark crash. I mean, even they are more, rec they are trading higher than the crash. The reason is because they are benefiting from this pandemic. And for example, Zoom, the company which we are using, is, is, is the share price went, went uh, I think, a um, few hundred uh, app, right? But if you ask me, the company individually, would I invest in Zoom? I would say no. The reason is because Zoom is a great company, but it's not profitable yet. It doesn't make profit. So um, I would probably have to analyze it, give it a few years to, 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 to just make sure I have a correct data to make a long-term investment. But if I'm trading Zoom, it will be a good investment for the short run. But I, I, I'm not recommending it's a good investment for now, but for me, it's not a profitable, profitable company yet. So I wouldn't invest in Zoom. Great, mm, thank you. Now, thinking back to your uni days, uh, right. what skills or what things did you learn at uni that you think are helpful for your, uh, your current role? Uh -huh. so, yeah, I, I personally think at university, you learn so many things. And, and the, the, I think the great things that you learn is to caution everything you learn. I think that's a, something, for example, you, you, you learn about the old formulas, which is great, but sometimes you, to understand them, you have to caution them. And by questioning them, I think you, you will understand them more. Mm. Uh, analytical yeah. skills, analytical analysis, the ability and to analyze, analyze. And the question, critical thinking. Yeah. yeah. Not to basically, I would say not to believe in them, but to caution them. When you question them, you understand them more. Mm. Right. I personally think yeah. that's the greatest thing I've learned to caution everything you learn. Yeah. Where you learn, I think, more than and accepting whatever you're learning. Yeah. Anything else? Um, I, I personally, I learned, um, I, I think, um, um, basically uh, having a group um, because I, we had a class, I mean, my classmates were quite every time we talked about the investment work, so uh, it, it was good because we, we had different people from different backgrounds. We were learning from each other. I think that was a, um, I think that was a great thing I learned at university because I was learning every from, from different people, from the lecture, 
one thing by asking question and again from the people around me and asking them question because they all have different views on their mind. So I was learning to see different views and then I was just questioning the views and that way you know, I think as well. Mm -hmm. So what kind of skills or what kind of things that you wish you had learned at uni that you, you would have been helpful for your current career? Anything that you wish you had done more at uni? Um, I, I, yeah, I would say like um, um, Excel to use more advanced Excel, I think. And yeah, things like um, using um, Microsoft Excel, not just a normal Excel to use an advanced one. And mm -hmm. I think I would be, um, yeah, an advantage uh, when I was at university. And I think to learn more about the, pro not programming, but to understand a little bit how the, the, the behind the, I mean, using Python, maybe something. Mm -hmm. Even though we don't use it here, but I can see there's a demand from um, employers, mm. right? Because um, they, they, they use the data now, all they need is uh, the data to understand the data. And then you have to use Python and, and some other, mm -hmm. um, yeah, to understand them. Great. And, um, you know, obviously uh, Wealth and Tax interviewed many students for the role. Yeah. What is it that uh, set you apart from other students, from other candidates? What do you think? What was the thing that stood out for them? Um, I, I think one thing I would say is when, you, when you're a student, it's good to be a student, but at the same time to understand that, that what you're studying outside of university. Um, I think, for example, I was, um, the university um, offered me to, to I made the Financial Times for free at that yeah. time. I was reading the Financial Times and I was um, actually participating in the market. So that, gave, that gives me an edge when I came for an interview. I pretty much knew what I was talking about, right? I mm. was saying, when they question, were questioning me about the market, I was challenging them. I had my own view. And I said, no, this is the way I think and it's gonna go. And, and so I personally think it's good to understand, not just about you, to, uh, to know the financial world outside of university, to take your university level, I think, farther, to understand more about how the world works, how the finance, what, I mean, I mean, how the market moves, for example. Was, mm. For example, at that time, gold were, um, because it was so much uncertainties, I think in the interview, they brought gold and I um, ended up discussing about gold. And, and gold were, I think at that, that, that time, I, was, I mentioned gold, I was bullish on gold. And I, was in, I think I invested my own money on gold at that time. And then I think even, it, my prediction was right. I think gold were, I think if you, um, I've been tracking gold, it's been going up with us since then. Mm, great, thank you. Perhaps I can open the floor now to other questions. Sure. Um, anyone, does anyone like to ask Awad any questions about his experience as a research analyst or his, how he got into this role and whether it's interesting or not? Please ask Awad any questions. Yeah, feel free to ask me, I, I mean. Anyone? Tara, Tara's group, do you have any questions? Um, not uh, as of now yet. Um. Okay, so we've stunned them into silence then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Navid, uh, anyone, Esther, uh, Janet, anybody, Kyle? Anyone got any question for for Awe? Um, uh, hi, I just have a, uh, just a small question. Um, upon completion of your degree, um, did you do any kind of work uh, work placement before you got your job, or um, what, no. what route did you take? Um, no, I didn't do any um, work placement or anything. But before I joined university, I had a work experience. It wasn't in finance, but I did work in um, credit management and a little bit of. But it wasn't for long. But I had I I, I don't think I I didn't have um, a finance experience but but I was uh, the, but I knew the financial world even though I didn't work in there but I was investing my own money at that time so I understand it but I did have work um, uh, I didn't work in finance exactly like in, in investment work okay okay yeah thank you no problem 
I'm sorry, I can't hear. Can you? Um, yeah, you have to be loud. Can you can you say it to me? Then I'll repeat to you. Oh, okay. All right. The question is: um, Do you find um, the experience uh, on the job experience that you had before um, joining uh, this uh, company were more helpful? No. Um, is more helpful than the degree? Um, I actually, I actually think you need a degree. For example, to I think most companies do require a degree, and and I think the degrees are something I think most companies look for. But the, the the things that you do, like the work experience or any other um, form of research or learning you do, is an additional. So I think the degree was quite helpful because um, I, I learned quite a lot at university and I, I met great people as well. And then they taught me so many things at university and the lectures, everything. So I think university is, um, I think something that you can learn so many things, but again, you can um, to further your knowledge. I think if you read more books and understand more about the financial world, that's an advantage. You have an edge. When you go to an interview, they will ask you. And sometimes they question you about the market you view and I think if you don't understand and if you don't have views, sometimes they might think you're not passionate about this, uh, I mean, the financial world. So I always think it's good that you have a degree and you have an advantage and you do follow the market every day. What's happening, for example, for example, what's happening today, how the lockdown will affect, um, if they ask you in an interview, how the lockdown will affect um, the investment world, which sector will be affected. I think things like that you need to know and to prepare for it, basically. Okay, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Um, can I ask you something? Um, did you think that um, investing your own money and yeah. then um, um, uh, uh, investigate, you have to um, follow some companies um, to see how's their performance and having your own money invested in that make, make you um, more interested in this kind of job? Um. Yeah, I mean, investing for, I mean, for a company is, is because you're doing a higher scale and you learn you have to do more and research than investing your own money at that stage before. But if, I think, you, you, yeah, you, you will have to look at the company differently when you're working for, because the research you do is pretty much, it has to be documented, it has to be followed with the regulation in so many ways. Um, um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's not the same because it's, you do it in a greater scale for other co with the company and it has to be documented, as I said earlier. And you have to look at, at it properly and then and, and explaining the reason why. Well, for example, if you have to invest your own money, it's, it's, you don't have to explain anything. You just have to do your research and you have to invest it. But for the firm, you have to um, challenge your ideas. You have to say, this is the reason why I believe. For example, um, we, were, we are bullish on China. And I have to say why we are bullish on China. The reason is you just have to mention the reason why. So I always think it's different, but you have to give a reason why you think you're right. Okay. Yeah. So they, it's important to, to have your own views, to be able to analyze them and to be able to justify your views, really, isn't it? That's what you're saying. So right. we would expect a graduate to be you know, confident about um, defending their own positions and right. provide evidence and arguments to support them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. My, yeah. Yeah. So they need someone who is inquisitive, but also critical in their thinking and who, who have their own opinion about things rather than just, uh, you know, go with the, the trends and, you know, say what people want to hear. So, right. right. Yeah. Because they want to an, an employee to think independently. They don't want them um, to, I mean, to tell to tell them. I mean, every time they want. Them yes. To yes. So I you, mean, they want you to work on your own initiative and to be a critical thinker and right. to take charge of the project, really, isn't it? So that's what you're doing for yeah. wealth and tax. You're adding a lot of value because you can take the the, the, the burden off Tony and you know release him to do other things. Right. Yeah. yeah. So Tony, do you agree that Adwell is a great asset to your company? He's the. <laughs> oh, on the spot now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course he is. Of course. He is. Yeah. I've heard wonderful things about you. Tony says that, that you're, you know, a great asset, and uh, you know, so maybe use this opportunity to negotiate better pay rise than yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, a big pay rise now, and I'll forget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so does anyone else have any more questions for Tony and Awit? No. I think you need to impress them if you want to go for these prizes that they're offering you. Yeah. You know, this is a really great opportunity to ask them uh, about the latest trends, the latest, uh, you know, the secrets into the world of investment. So please um, ask any question you want. This is your chance. Yeah. <coughs> Can you be a bit louder? I can't hear. Um, like personally, or yeah, okay, okay. Uh, this student uh, would like to find out when you said you were investing. Uh, were you investing in the stock market or any other uh, investment? Um, yes, when I was a student, I was invested in the stock market. Um, pretty much, it was um, analyzed. I, I look at company, and I it was a short term investment. So it was pretty much, um, yeah, investing in the short run, yeah, in the stock market equities. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? No. We've stunned them into silence for the end. Yeah, that's great. No, we, uh, I think it's been a great, really great session to have the opportunity to ask experts like yourself questions about investments. So we're really grateful for your time. And th so thank you very much, Tony and Awet, for your contribution you. and for your help, because I think, you know, even though they don't ask questions, I'm sure the session has changed the way they think about investments now and hopefully has inspired them to take a greater interest in the area, which I think is really important to do if they want to grow wealth, doesn't it? Yes, right.